he starts off uh, with this word in his, and we're, now we understand it's in the third chapters. We got four chapters here. So he's in the middle of the book. I've got, I'm scheduled to preach in Philippians all the way to, uh, into November. And he says, finally. Now, isn't that like a preacher? You know, you, you listen to the guy preach for a long time. He says, finally. And then 10 minutes later, he says, finally again. And you say, when is the final final going to be there? And so, anyway, this is his first final. And he does this, this. He says, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things again to you is no trouble to me, and it is a safeguard for you. He's, he's coming back to it again, rejoice. And just constantly coming back to this thing, this rejoice is coming through in the book of Philippians. And we have to understand that that's what he's doing, is he's trying to get us to the place of being able to have a sound, solid foundation that we can rejoice in the Lord fully and completely. Now, my sermon is not going to be about rejoicing this morning. Uh, it's going to be there, but don't worry, we will come back to it again, because he's going to go to Philippians 4, 4, and we know that we're going to, we're going to deal with it. But nevertheless, I, you got to see this thing. It's really cool. He's just driving this home inside of the heart is rejoice in the Lord, and so we have that thing. But he says, until then, i got a problem. we got a problem here. You'll notice last time that uh, he says <clears throat> in chapter 2 that he circumcised, uh, <clears throat> he circumcised Timothy. Now he knows what's going to happen as a result of that. He's going he's to have those individuals out there that promote circumcision, and not only circumcision, but the, the folding of the whole Hebrew law into, their, into the lives of the believers. And they're going to try to enslave the people to believe in Jesus back into the Jewish ways of doing things. And they're going to look at that and they say, see, even Paul is into circumcision because he circumcised Timothy. So therefore, that would justify them in their present presentation. But in three, Philippians 3, 2, he says this, beware of the dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the false circumcision. Paul just said something that would twist things around if he did not speak. And so he, he wants to undo that before it becomes a problem. And so he sees that what might happen back there when he circumcised Timothy. He says, now I want you guys to rejoice, but I also want you to be aware that there's going to be coming around, somebody going to come around and try to steal your joy away from you. So listen to this. He says, he does not, but, he does not, <clears throat> but he does know others will use it to promote false teachings, and he is not happy with this whole thing. So he's not happy with it. He knows that they're going to do it. And so he says to him, now beware of these false teachers. He doesn't, he wants to make it really, really clear where his position on is this. And so he says this, beware of the dogs. He's not even giving these people very much of a, a movement here either. And he also, you'll notice this, in the next thing is making it clear, he says this, he doesn't even use the normal word for circumcision. I know in the version that I use is the word circumcision, but it is not there. Concision is another verse word that is used, and this concision is meaning the cutting off or a mutilation. And he's, he's, he's not only giving them the word of, he's not giving them any, any credit or whatsoever. He wants them to know that he is totally against what these people are going to be teaching him. He wants them to know that this is, this is horrible stuff, what they're going to do. It is not the action that is disgusting to him. This is the next line. It is not the action that is disgusting, but the attempt to enslave that he is revolting against. He's saying these guys are going to come along and they're going to teach you something that you can find in the Bible. He's not fighting the Bible here. You're going to find it in the Bible, yes. But he's, he's, these guys are using it for another means. He's using it, they're using it in order to slave you into a system that didn't work before. Take you back into the old covenant. And the old covenant did not work. It, was a, it worked what it was supposed to do. It was to teach us that it is impossible to please God in the flesh. You can't do it. And these guys are going to try to bring you back into the flesh, trying to please God in the flesh. So he makes it a lesson. He makes it a lesson. He says this in Philippians 3.3. 3, he says, For we are the true circumcision who worship in the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. He puts no confidence in flesh. He says, we're of the true circumcision. I'm not against circumcision. 
in the sense of, of what it is, it, but it's not necessary. We need to be circumcised in the heart. That is where we need to be. We are the true circumcision because we are not. We're cutting off the flesh of the heart. We're doing that, rid of that stuff of the world system, and we're going to go to what God has given to us in the person of Jesus Christ, which is called the gospel. Who died? He, Jesus, who, who <clears throat> died on the cross for us, who was buried, who was ascended into, who was buried and who raised from the dead and ascended into heaven, and we wait for Him in glory. This is the Jesus that we're serving, and this is the thing that God's going to do for us. So He says, "I learned this thing: is that we put no confidence whatsoever in the flesh." The next verse, Philippians 3, 4, says this, Although I myself might have confidence even in the flesh, if anyone else has a mind to put confidence in the flesh, I far more. So he says, this is what I would do. If I was into the flesh thing, I could, I could do this much better than they could. Because listen to this, Paul has a flesh list. He has seven things on his flesh list that he has that he would commend himself if he was into that whole thing of bringing people into enslavement to the Old Testament law. He says this, I was, I was circumcised the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the zeal, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to the righteousness which is in the law found blameless. Found blameless. As to the law, the righteousness that is in the law, I was found blameless. He's saying, I, I could go to the flesh and I could say, this is, this is pleasing to God. But he knows it isn't going to cut it. He knows that it isn't going to cut it. Down. He says, this, this whole thing that they would want to do to you is going to bring you into destruction. I do not want you to fall into destruction. Do not be pulled into the flesh, that there's anything that I can present before God that Jesus Christ has not already provided would bring me into the place of enslavement all over again. So he says, I don't do that. What I do is this. All that I just listed, all these wonderful lists of stuff that I, I do in my flesh and all the training that I had with Gamaliel and, and all that stuff that I went through. He says this in verse 37, he says this, but whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. I counted as loss. In other words, here you have a list up here of, of things that are, are good stuff that I have in my pedigree. And I don't even erase them. What I do is I tear them off and I throw it away. For the sake of Christ, I tear everything of all my abilities and all the things that God has given me and all the training that I had and everything that I did that was supposed to be pleasing to God, I have torn those things off and I count it as lost, as nothing of value whatsoever. Nothing of value whatsoever. On top of that, he says this in 3.8. He says, more than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish so that I may gain Christ. And I may gain Christ. I count them as rubbish. That word rubbish is an interesting word. It's the word that means refuse. It means, uh, it means poop. That's what I do. You know, I count it as poop. You know, it's just absolutely nothing of value. There's another usage of the word that's an interesting one, though. It is also the word that is used for a banqueting table when everybody is finished. All the stuff that is on the banqueting table that wasn't eaten, that was fed to the dogs, that's what it is. That's what I consider it. It's just, just leftover stuff. It's not of anything of value whatsoever. I, I'm just, I, this is it. In... I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things. Understand that our faith in Jesus Christ is not a religion of sometime later on we'll stand before God and say, God, you're great. That is not what it's about. It is that God has called us into a relationship with him that we may know him, that we may understand him, that we may interact with him. 
He says, grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Is not knowing about Jesus, is knowing him, who he is, and what he is about you. He has a personal relationship with every single one who comes to him in faith. He speaks to all of our hearts. You'll hear me say this over and over again. There are those who are called into the ministry of doing certain things. And you have, all of us have gone into a place where each and every one of us is called into a ministry. Some of those ministries are speaking ministries, and so you wind up in front of a group of people and speaking. But other ministries are not speaking ministries. There's all sorts of gifts that God gives to us and the abilities that he gives to you. And he speaks to each and every one of us, and he walks with each and every one of us. Remember the songs that we sing? Uh, most of those songs are relational, relational things of God is speaking to me. I... Uh, in the garden is one of those things that we, you know, that we come to the garden and, he, and my Lord, I'm speaking in the garden with the Lord and, and oh, it's just a wonderful place and I hate to leave the garden because I have to leave my Lord. No, you don't, you don't do that. Jesus Christ is always with you. I said, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. I will come alongside of you. I will be with you. It is not going through somebody else to get to God. You do not go through a pastor. You do not go through a priest. You do not go through any person to get to God. The relationship that we have with God is that you may know him. And it's the surpassing value of knowing him that makes it so it's worth living the Christian life. That I may know him. Everything falls onto that knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. And everything that we do, all the training that we go through, is only useful in the sense of that I may have that as a means by which that I can bring other individuals into this saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is what it's all about. And so what do we replace all this stuff that I ripped off? What do we replace that with? Okay, found in Philippians 3.9, we start this. Number one, he says, I want to know him. That's number one, really. I want to know him. And the second thing he says is, and may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. This is the righteousness, that I may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own, but a righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. This is the most amazing thing. I, I guess I could ask this question. On what basis, on what basis is a man right before God? On what basis is he acceptable to God? On what basis? And I could ask this question, is it by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, or is it by works of, uh, that I do in the flesh? Most of you would say by faith, but it is not true. Now I'll get back to that, but the basis of acceptance before God is absolute righteousness. Absolute righteousness. It says, but the just shall live by faith. God has always had the same standard. In order to get into heaven, you have to be absolutely, 100% righteous. Now, how many of you qualify to go into heaven with that standard? You know, yourself. Yeah. And that's what makes the gospel the gospel. The standard never changes. God didn't say, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to abrogate my, my righteousness standard and let people get into heaven that are not righteous. He doesn't change that. He is just, and he says, this is my standard. You cannot get into heaven without absolute righteousness. Absolute righteousness. But you can't do it, and I can't do it. None of us can do it. So therefore, he sent his son, Jesus, to come to earth to be a sacrificial lamb for us and take upon himself all the sins of the world, your sins, my sins, every sin, all past, present, and future sins are in Jesus Christ. And God pours his wrath out on his own son and judges that sin in his own son. So that Jesus carries our sins far away and then he is raised to newness of life. So that those who put their faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ have their sins dealt with by Jesus and then they stand before God with a righteousness that is an alien righteousness. Alien in the sense that it's not our own righteousness that we stand before God. 
It is a righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. It is the very righteousness of God that we present before God. And so when you stand before God in heaven, and God says, why should I let you into my heaven? The answer is because I received Jesus Christ as my personal Savior and Lord. Yes. But it is also true is because I have the very righteousness of Christ in me and on me. This is amazing what God does for you, the believer. He does not leave you just to come into heaven and clean your act up later. He cleans you completely and entirely by faith. And then he allows you to come into his heaven with not your righteousness, but the righteousness that he himself has. This makes us acceptable to God because we have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So we come back to that same, when I ask that question, how can you stand before God? It's by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. It is by faith that I receive the righteousness of God. But if I don't have the righteousness of God, I cannot enter heaven. And therefore, I have to have faith in Jesus in order to do it. So it comes back and, and you're right, but you also have to think your way through this thing as the reason why I'm able to stand before God in this glorious time is because God has provided me the way to do it through my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So yes, I want to know him. Yes, I want to know him. I want to know him and the power of his resurrection. I want to know him and all the things that he does in order that I might understand fully what he is doing. And going on, number two, he says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. Yes, I want to do that. I want to know him. I want to know his righteousness. I want to live in that righteousness. I want to dwell in that righteousness. I want to, I want to, I want to, I want to be what God is, is doing inside of me. I want to be conformed to that image that Jesus is forming within me. And that I may know the power of his resurrection. This is, this is amazing. The power of his resurrection, this power of his resurrection is a thing that comes to every person who believes that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. The power of God comes to dwell inside of you. And this is the same power to the same degree and to the same extent as the power that raised Jesus from the dead. That is power. And it dwells within us. This is who we are. But you may not know it but you can know it. And so Paul says, I count all this stuff in my life as worthless, of nothing value. In order that I may gain Christ in the knowledge of him, I want to know him, and I want to know his righteousness, and I want to know his power. I'm not going to settle for anything less than that. And then he says in three, he says, and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. And the fellowship of his sufferings. This is an interesting thing with Paul. Whenever he first met the Lord through the event that he had on the Damascus Road, he went into Damascus blind, and for three days and three nights he was blind. But there's a fellow by the name of Ananias there that God was speaking to, to go in to speak to, ba to uh, Paul and to baptize him into Christ. And <clears throat> Ananias says, Lord, are you sure you want to do this? You know, you, Lord, are you really, you, don't you know? <laughs> That's a kind of silly thing to say to God, but he says, don't you know? This guy has been breathing fire and brimstone toward us. He's come here to take us into captivity. You're wanting me to go to him? And God said to him this, an interesting thing. He said, go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine, and I must show him what he must suffer for my name's sake. Show him what he must suffer for my name's sake. And Paul says, later on in his life, after he's been stoned, and probably to the point of death, after he's been, all the things that he lists out, I won't even go through all the lists of things, but all these things that he suffered for the name of Jesus, and he says, I want to know, still doing it, in order that I may, that I, I want to know the fellowship of his suffering. I want to I be there with my Lord. My Lord suffered for me. I want to suffer for him. And so here, this is a, you think, oh, that's negative. In the, no, it's not. I've been called out of darkness and transferred into the kingdom of his dear son. 
By his doing, we are in Christ Jesus. By his doing, we have come from death into life. By his doing, we have come from darkness into light. From his doing, we have come from sin into righteousness. And a righteousness that is a most amazing righteousness. The very righteousness of God himself. Yeah. Lord, whatever it is that you want to send down my road... I want to go and grab a hold of it and I want to experience whatever you want me to experience. For I know that the end story, I know the end of the story. Don't you know the end of the story? I mean, I I do those funerals all over the place. And as long as the person's a believer, I know the end of the story. I know that when their eyes close in this world, that you open them up in the glories of God. And it is a most amazing thing for to be Absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And that's a glorious thing that God has given to us. And this is the hope that we have. And we live our lives oftentimes when negative things happen. We, we, we don't go to our heart of hearts and say, God causes all things to work together for the good of those who love God, those who called according to purposes. We go, ah, what are, the, what are you doing, God? Make me more like you, Jesus. And then he sits us in the fire and we say, I don't like the fire. No, embrace the fire. Because there is nothing that's going to come your way that is not from the hand of God. Now, it could be from the hand of Satan himself, but it's still from the hand of God. Job's in a situation like that. God did something. And he was working in Job's life. And Job embraced what God was doing, and he never gave the devil credit one iota. He saw it as from the hand of God, and it was. Take a look at that. Satan comes before God. God says, have you considered my servant Job? Job's going, don't bring me up. I don't want to be involved. But God is the one that initiated that whole conversation. God is the one who is working these things out in us. So I, I, I make a mistake. I err over here. I have a rock fall on my head over here. Whatever it is. Oh, okay. God, whatever it is, that you, I, I'm ready for whatever it is. We're coming into a time in history that we don't know what's going to happen. The way things are accelerating, the way things are going away from God, at, at this clip that we're getting here, even those who are, are, are against God are using God as the means by which they're, they're doing their thing. And, and it, it's getting really confusing for people, and it's getting tough. And it could get to the place where we wind up with a lot of persecution coming back. We think in America it's not going to happen, but it could. It could. The world goes crazy every once in a while. World War I was crazy. World War II was even crazier. Insane. Madness. And people do that. Who'd have thought? God has even the nations, the borders of the nations and the timing of the nations, written in his book. And when the nation's done, he's done. You take a look at all those big, na- big empires that were there. It took one man, Alexander the Great, to come through and wipe, wipe out the Persian Empire. Just poof, very short period of time. He died. Alexander the Great, after he conquered all these things, he was only 30 years old. And he died a drunk because he was, he was moaning because he didn't have anybody else to conquer. Yeah, things can change very, very quickly. Very quickly. Paul says that I, I grab a hold of this, that I may know him, that I may know his, his righteousness and the power of his resurrection and the, and the fellowship of his sufferings in order that. See, he says, in order that. I want to know these things in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. It's okay to want to go home to be with the Lord. It's okay to say, I'm willing to do this because I know that my Lord is going to take me into his home. I know it. 
And I'm willing to do whatever it is that makes it so that other people can know the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm willing to pay whatever price it is that I may be able to drag others to the saving grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the throne of grace, that they may have life and may have a life eternal. That's the promise of God to us. Embrace it. It's okay to want to be saved. It's okay. It's not anything to be ashamed of. I remember one time when I was a kid, I didn't know the Lord Jesus Christ. I had no idea. But even in there, at that point, I think there's something in the heart of every individual that wants to go home. I told my mom, I said to her, one morning, one afternoon, whatever it is, I said, I want to go home. And she said, you are home. I mean, I was living in my house. You are home. I said, no, there's something else there. I don't think this is the place where we were meant to be. And it is not the place where we're meant to be. God had something totally different in mind. But our rebellion against him brought about sin. And with sin came death. And this world was corrupted. But there's going to be a day when this creation is going to be set free from its corruption. And we're going to see what we're really all about. And that's a glorious thing. We've got to write it out until we get there. So let us be like Paul, who says, I count all this stuff, everything that I've succeeded in, everything I've been trained in, I count that as no value whatsoever other than this, that I know the one who loved me and died for me, was buried for me, and rose again from the dead. That is all I want to know. Paul says to the Corinthians, he says, I determined to know nothing among you except this one thing, that Jesus is death, burial, and resurrection. That's all I care. So what I want, it's the foundation of everything that we do as believers in Lord Jesus Christ. But he does it in order that you might have eternal life. God loves you. God loves you. You may be sitting there saying, God, I'm messing up. God says, I love you anyway. I love it when Isaiah says, God speaks to the, the, the uh, <clears throat> Israelites. He says, I know you, but I'm going to save you anyway. <laughs> That's me. God says, I know you. Hey, yeah, but I'm going to save you anyway. God is the one who saves. God is the one who saves. He will not hold back. And he will not keep anything from you. He is the one who saves. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this marvelous wording of your scriptures that we have today, that you may strengthen and encourage us through them, that may may fill us with understanding and wisdom, that we may be able to submit ourselves to the truth that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and that we put our full faith and trust in him, willing to follow him no matter where he leads us. He will lead us into all sorts of things, but none of it will get us any better with you than just knowing the Lord Jesus Christ is. Lord, I thank you for all that you're doing in our lives now. Pray that you strengthen and encourage us now in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that we may follow you with our whole heart and our whole mind. And Father, if there be somebody here that doesn't know you as their personal Savior and Lord, or if somebody is struggling with their own sin in their lives, then I pray that they'll pray this prayer with me. Lord Jesus, I need you. I open the door of my life and receive you as my personal Savior and Lord. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. I repent. I turn away from my ways of things. I turn away from my stuff. I turn to you, O oh God. I'm looking to you fully and completely for your salvation, which is only found in the person of Jesus Christ. And you make us, fill us with full wisdom and that we may fully, fully follow you with all of our heart, follow you in the waters of baptism, follow you into the days and years of discipleship, follow you wherever may be that you lead us, that we follow you. We set aside our thoughts, we set aside our ways, and look totally, completely to your ways. We thank you, Lord Jesus. Bless every person here today. In Jesus' name.
follow him with all of your heart, mind, and soul. You are the people of God, and who is Lord? Jesus. Amen.